Thank you, Phil. Um, now, that, now that I feel we've all arrived here, um, I'd like to introduce you to, to Bill. Um, there are no further words. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I look forward to our time together and our discussion. And um, I'm going to just kind of talk off the top of my head for a while. No statistics tonight, I'm sorry. If you want them, you have to read our articles. They're out there on the web. Um, I'm going to kind of reminisce about uh, the 56 years since I got involved in this field and uh, the insights that uh, bounced around and developed as life went on. And let's just see where we go together. Actually, I was thinking, you know, the, you may know the classic stages of uh, the mystical life in the literature is that, you know, there's the initial enlightenment, the glimpse of the eternal world, and then what comes? It's the period of purgation and purification and the dark night of the soul, you know? And then, if you survive all that, there's this gradual period of illumination, of uh, waking up, integrating the insights, applying them to everyday life, and living the so-called spiritual life of chopping wood and carrying water, and remembering the reality of the eternal. Kind of parallels my own life, and it parallels the whole psychedelic movement, really, in the last uh, uh, few decades. Let me take you back in time to, believe it or not, I was 23 years old once. And I was a student at the University of Göttingen, uh, studying both theology and psychiatry. And in the, essentially the backyard around the corner of where, where I was living, was the university's Nervin clinic, the nerve clinic, the psychiatric clinic. And some guy there called Hans Karl Leuner was doing research with some drug called psilocybin that I had never heard of. And the rumor was that it evoked memories from early childhood. I was studying my dreams then, and I thought, gee, that sounds interesting. Uh, maybe I'll get some insights into my early childhood. I went over and asked if I could apply, and they said, sure, you know, do you, are you in basically good physical health? Uh, do you get drunk very often? <laughs> no to either of those. Um, remember, this is a time, this is the golden age. Psychedelics aren't controversial. They're fully legal. Sandoz is mailing them through the general mail to any psychiatrist who would like to test them on his patients or her patients. You know? uh, just no big deal. Of course you can give psychedelics to a graduate student especially if they write a good report. You know? It'd be interesting to see what they experience, you know? Um, Leuner had just written a book called The Experimental Psychosa, The Experimental Psychoses. And this was the psychotomimetic phase of research where the hope was that it would help us understand schizophrenia better. Uh, and so, what did they do with me? They led me to a little basement room with a cock, an end table, and a little narrow window that looked out over the hospital garbage cans. <laughs> and they gave me an injection of psilocybin and left me alone. <laughs> and uh, I think 
what saved me was uh, the piety of my Methodist childhood. That, that I, I decided that God would be with me if any terrible insights about my mother arose. <laughs> Not that my mother was all that bad, really, but I knew I did have an edible complex. And uh, <laughs> to my total amazement, this absolutely, exquisitely beautiful, uh, eternal, realm of consciousness opened up. And I didn't even know that was a possibility. I hadn't even heard the word psychedelic. I had no idea what psilocybin was. And I remember in the middle of the experience, uh, the garbage men came and emptied the metal garbage cans outside the window. And I registered it as tinkling temple bells. <laughs> and when the research, uh, uh, what should I call it? He wasn't a real, really a research assistant. He was a psychiatric resident. But he came in to see how I was doing as the drug was wearing off. And I said, what was that drug you gave me? <laughs> how do you spell it? Uh, and uh, I was one very odd 23-year-old. Uh, and in many ways, the rest of my life, uh, you could see it as footnotes to that day. Um, so I became known in the clinic as that very interesting American student who had the mystical experience. They were very rare in those days because of the lack of supportive set and setting and the relatively low dosage that was usually administered. Um, but uh, in fact, in Lorner's book, there's half of one page called Cosmic Mysticious Erlebnisse. You know, that every now and then people report these strange transcendental experiences. And I mention them here just for sake of comprehensiveness. But there was no idea of the therapeutic potential potency of these experiences at that time. Uh, but anyway, I got involved in the clinic as a volunteer because there were all these people coming through, especially from the United States, who wanted to have a psychedelic experience where it was still legal. And they needed people to sort of guide or be present. And you know, so I got involved. That's where my years of guiding uh, began. Um, and several, many hundreds of people later, I'm still learning, actually. And it's amazing how much uh, there is to learn in this field. <laughs> the human mind is just uh, incredibly vast and rich. And uh, it, it's never repetitive. It's never boring. Um, for those of you who have had the opportunity to administer psychedelics to people. Uh, you, you, you know what I'm trying to say. It's re really an amazing, amazing frontier. In fact, I often think that, uh, I often think of especially psychiatrists. Uh, there are so many psychiatrists in the world right now who came into the field because they really cared about people and because they were intrigued with how the human mind works. You know? And so many of those well-intentioned people are locked into positions right now where they're adjusting medication every 15 minutes. And some of them don't even know what psychotherapy is. I bet if you ask the average psychiatrist what an archetype was, he or she probably wouldn't know. You know? <laughs> You know? And so, you know, one thing that psychedelics do is they awaken us 
to this incredible variety and richness uh, within the human mind. You know, I mean, uh, states of consciousness beyond your personal life. Where do they come from? Uh, don't ask me, you know? Are they genetically encoded? Do we access them spiritually somehow? But it's very common for people to experience content that does not seem part of their personal development at all. But somehow it's part of the human mind. And then there are these absolutely amazing, uh, what we call transcendental or non-dual or mystical experiences of, of unity and transcendence of time and space and secretness, uh, not necessarily in the form of any institutional religion, but just, uh, just incredible beauty and meaning, uh, a sense of um, the power of love, uh, love not as a mushy emotion, uh, but as uh, what Dante meant at the end of the Divine Comedy in the very last line, he says, it is love that moves the sun and other stars, that it's an intelligent energy somehow deep in the core of each of us. This is pretty profound stuff. <laughs> and it goes beyond uh, language and our current co concepts. It's, this is the very frontier of scientific knowledge in the mental health field, I think. We're, we're just generating new ideas, new concepts, to try to begin to uh, assimilate uh, the promise that awaits us. I learned some things very early uh, in Göttingen. Uh, for example, I remember the, the, a theological student I was asked to guide through a session, and uh, he turned his back to me. I couldn't communicate to him. And then, as the drug was wearing off, he said, Ich habe es geschafft. I did it. And I said, well, what was going on? He said, well, there was this big whirlpool trying to suck me down into the depths of the ocean. And I swam against it the whole time, and it never got me. I finally uh, survived. <laughs> you know, the drug wore off. You know? <laughs> well, we call that resistance. <laughs> like, who knows what, what he would have found in the depths of the ocean? had he been prepared, as we prepare people now to trust, let go, be open. Choose to entrust yourself to the wisdom of your own mind. You know? We didn't know that back then. You know? uh, I think of the uh, engineer I talked to, uh, obsessive compulsive victim who uh, had 500 micrograms of LSD in his system. And I asked, well, what's going on? He said, I think the air is flimmering just a little bit. <laughs> Resistance, fear, and who knows what's going on biochemically, you know? Uh, so we have these people we can give high doses to who experience almost nothing. And then there are these people you know, like Abraham Maslow, who never even took a psychedelic, who would lie down in his backyard and the heavens would open up, you know? <laughs> Is that our own generation of dipropyltryptamine or uh, something in our brain chemistry that's going on? Who knows what's going on? We're going to find out, hopefully. Uh, Robin Carhart Harris and the gang are on the, working hard on the path there. Um, I came back from Germany and I had written a report of my experiences. Uh, there were several of them, uh, some incredibly beautiful, some 
one in particular that was really psychotic. I learned a lot about paranoia in that one. Um, and I went to the head of the psychology of religion at Yale, where I was studying, and I shared my experience. And I found he was not the least bit interested. He was embarrassed by religious experiences. His area of specialization was how theological students were tied to their mothers. And uh, this was just irrelevant. So he gave me an article to critique to, with statistics, lots of statistics to prove I could do critical thinking. And then I went to my professor of Hinduism, Norvin Hine, who just died a couple years ago at 103. Uh, and Norvin read my report, and he just looked at me and said, now you know. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to go too far off on this tangent, but I often think in, we talk a lot about the need to integrate psychedelic experiences and the need for groups to support integration. And I think, my gosh, you know, we have this institution in our society called churches and synagogues and mosques where people get together and support one another in their spiritual development and all the adjustments we make through life. Uh, what would it take to awaken the religious community to this frontier, you know? Uh, at the present time, <laughs> most of the religious community is still asleep, you know? Uh, I've been invited to Yale to this School of Medicine. There's a dynamic group, probably about 20 in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, Ben Kelmendi and uh, Jordan Slowshower and the gang, they're doing, doing exciting things in psychedelic research and people are having these profound revelatory experiences in the School of Psychiatry. I haven't heard anything from the Divinity School yet. <laughs> Maybe eventually they'll wake up, you know? And it was the same thing in Göttingen, actually. The School of Medicine had fascinating courses in uh, uh, delusions, or, or yeah, one on the, uh, the, um, the experiences of, of schizophrenic patients and the different states of consciousness reported. Uh, there was a big auditorium full of medical students where people were learning self-hypnosis, autogenic training, and meditative techniques, um, and so on. But so the whole experiential dimension of religion in Göttingen, as at Yale right now, and I'm not sure what's happening here, uh, was in the School of Medicine. It's just fascinating. You know? um, I remember going to a theological course that met at seven in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, literally, where they argued about the meaning of some Hebrew word for an hour. <laughs> it just was not what I was looking for. Okay, uh, journey continues here. Uh, I fall in love and get married. Uh, with uh, my friend Walter Pankey, who did the Good Friday study uh, at my side. Uh, and then we, we all moved from Boston to Baltimore uh, to do research at Spring Grove State Hospital, which became the Maryland Psychiatric Re Research Center. This is in 1967. And um, we have government grants for <laughs> study of, of LSD with hospitalized, depressed people, and with uh, narcotic addicts, and with alcoholics, and we have funding to work with terminal cancer patients, 
uh, with LSD and then with dipropyl tryptamine, DPT. Uh, the staff is growing. It's a very hopeful, exciting time. Um, I can remember us sitting around the conference table debating how we're going to train the hordes of therapists that are going to be needed in five years. And then the excitement is so much that the state of Maryland builds us the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, a brand new four-story building with psychedelic suites, uh, you know, with kitchenettes and special bathrooms and fabulous furnishings and stereo systems, uh, biochemical laboratories, animal laboratories, sensory isolation rooms, uh, and even a sensory isolation tank. Uh, EEG, material equipment, and so on, you know? And all the positions to fund that, you know, including a job for me, fortunately. <laughs> Finally, I had a stable position that wasn't grant related. Uh, this was 1969. And in 1970, uh, Nixon signed the uh, legislation, uh, certainly discouraging the field and saying Timothy Leary was the most dangerous man in America. And it's incredible how the uh, political climate, you know, eventually totally squelched the research. You know, you, I think that's probably unprecedented in unprecedented in the history of science, you know. Uh, there were all these publications, international conferences, everything. Um, and uh, actually, the, it's important to know the federal government did not stop the research. Uh, what actually stopped it was uh, a committee of the uh, University of Maryland a Department of Psychiatry who decided this was just too controversial. There was stuff in the newspapers, why are we using Maryland tax dollars to give people LSD, you know? And uh, the, uh, it just totally closed down. So in 1977, as I said, it got down to me and two secretaries and then it became two secretaries. And uh, I still remember uh, emptying out my desk and going down the elevator with my two sons who were one and three at that time. And doing my best to accept that this field that looked so incredibly promising was becoming totally dormant. So that invites, can that, can that happen again? You know? What can we do to protect against that type of thing? Uh, we, not, we had lots of testimonials there, case studies of one in, that were published, but we had very few well-designed research studies, and now we do have a literature. If you take science seriously, science is pretty supportive of this, you know? Um, Got several trajectories here I could run on. Um, and, you know, I, I feel I'm among friends here. I'm going to tell you a story uh, of my wife uh, that I have never done before. Uh, my wife, Ilza, uh, I mean, it's my first wife, I should say. Uh, was born in 1936, and uh, when she was seven years old, growing up in Dortmund, she was a German, became a psychiatric nurse. 
She was traumatized by the bombing of Dortmund. So she suffered from depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Whenever a fire truck went by, she panicked. It, it was always an air raid siren. And I said, no, 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 Ilza, you know, they're going to help someone. <laughs> you know, the firemen are good people. They're going to put out a fire. You know, but for her, the sound would just somatically uh, trigger uh, this uh, very reliable, annoying, terrifying response. Well, uh, when we moved to Baltimore, uh, she was hired at Spring Grove as a psychiatric nurse, so we got to work together, which was really very wonderful. And in those days, in order to be allowed in the room with someone receiving a psychedelic drug, you had to have at least two LSD sessions. Very different days. <laughs> so as part of her on-the-job training, she got her first two LSD experiences. Um, also, let me tell you, before this point, she really felt it just wasn't right to bring children into the world. There's too much suffering in the world, you know? Uh, well, anyway, these two LSD experiences, I dare say, completely eliminated her depression and her post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, we do controlled studies, and I've done an awful lot of them over the years, and we develop our statistics to try to prove that this really can impact depression or really can impact post-traumatic stress. Uh, and I'm all for that. That's the way we communicate in the scientific world. But I have to confess in my own experience, I'm pretty convinced that it can be powerful. Because you know? she went on uh, to be a, uh, a woman who loved motherhood. Um, Here's a, it's a, this may be hard to believe, though it's in my book, uh, that uh, uh, one of the cancer patients she and I worked with, who, a 50-year-old man who was dying, uh, turned out literally to have been one of the men who dropped bombs on Dortmund when she was a child. Forgive a little emotion if it uh, surges here. Uh, but um, here's a seven year old child being traumatized, a 19 year old young American fighting Nazis. Then we have a 36 year old psychiatric nurse who's a co-therapist in psychedelic research and a 49-year-old terminal cancer patient. <laughs> and there's something about the, the beauty the uh, forgiveness the acceptance of how we get caught up in political currents in different periods of our lives you know they communicated 
through their love of Bach and Brahms. And uh, she helped him die. I think that's what you meant by synchronicity. <laughs> Incredible. Um, so let me just segue from that to just say of all the applications of psychedelics, you know, in medicine, you know, addictions, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress, you name it, in education, potentially, in uh, religion. You know, I think what uh, grabs me most is the potential for changing the way we die. And uh, there are a number of oncologists right now who are very eager to uh, introduce psilocybin therapy into their oncology practices in palliative care, um, including Amanda Fielding, who we're happy to have here. <coughs> yeah. um, the old saying, just because you're mortal doesn't mean you have to be depressed. Yeah. And it's very true. Um, people can really enjoy the last day of their lives. Yeah. And there's something about the effectiveness of these profound alternative states of consciousness uh, that uh, not only reduces anxiety and depression, but it opens up interpersonal relationships, uh, allows for forgiveness and acceptance in family systems, and for those who have these, or remember, I don't know if you have it or it has you, but when these profound transcendental unitive states occur, people often claim loss of a fear of death. And it's not necessarily that they think pers of personal immortality, that their little ego is going to live on forever, but there's a sense that the universe is in good hands. And there's something uh, indestructible about consciousness, and there's something incredibly beautiful about consciousness. And what is so amazing is that this happens in all kinds of people. You know, it's not just the uh, you know, PhDs with uh, doctorates in uh, English literature that experience this. It, it's the inner city person who slumped out of junior high school who experiences this. You know? That it, you know, I've seen it so many times, I'm you know, personally convinced this is simply the intrinsic to human consciousness. It's not something we generate or uh, it's there waiting to be discovered. And that's pretty profound. Um, Just continuing the story a little bit longer. Um, the year before the research got completely dormant, uh, my wife Ilza was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, you know, uh, if you're going to do the dark night of the soul, you may as well do it deeply. And uh, at first we were kind of bemused by it, almost saying, well, gee, you know, we work with terminally ill people. If anyone can handle this, we ought to be able to do it, you know? <laughs> and actually we did. She lived very fully for a decade before her death. And, but when her death did occur, um, our sons were uh, 11 and 13 at that time. Um, there, again, there was no depression. There was, there was sadness. There was, you know, I wish I could understand why this has to happen at age 50. I'd like to hang around a bit longer, you know. But uh, she was able to live fully, right, to the last breath, interact genuinely with our kids, 
um, was never in severe pain. Uh, and interestingly enough, was not interested in having a psychedelic session close to death. She felt she didn't need it. Like she remembered her experiences from earlier in life, you know? I often think, you know, there's a story of Aldous Huxley, who, when he was dying, asked Laura for LSD, and Laura gave it to him, first one dose and then another dose, and he finally died under LSD. I think that may have been symbolically meaningful, but it's a, to me it's like a dripping water on the head of someone before he dies into the ocean. <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it may be symbolic, but I'm not sure it's a good use of LSD. <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, I don't want to go on too long here. There's a few learnings that I want to just list um, that come out of all these years of working with so many people. Um, and one is to acknowledge the incredible, incredible uh, wisdom of the human psyche. Uh, you picked up on this, I think. But how, when you give a psychedelic to someone in a supportive setting, and I'll say more about that in a minute, what emerges is invariably skillfully choreographed from within. There's a wisdom in the mind that decides just how to present the material that needs to be discovered or resolved. And it's, re it's amazing. And it's invariably better than anything you could have designed in advance. You know, if you as a therapist with your patients said, you know, this guy has problems with his father from age seven, and let's see if we can regress him to age seven and deal with his father's alcoholism. If you try to manipulate it like that, I'm convinced what happens would be nowhere as effective or powerful as what emerges when you simply say, in the security of this relationship we've established, trust, let go, be open. Receive what your own mind brings to you. And what happens is simply amazing. You know? So here's a radical concept that we can trust the minds of our patients. You know? uh, they're smarter than we think. <laughs> Interpersonal grounding. You know, the, the challenge in being a psychedelic therapist is to establish an incredibly deep, profound, genuine rapport in a very brief period of time. You know, how do you do that? Uh, it's, I don't think there's any one way, but you have to be genuine, you have to be warm, you have to be focused, you have to be present. You have to be with a person as if there's no one in the world except the two of you. you know? And when that trust is established, and here's a very important word, the person is able to choose to relinquish control. And I, I like to... Uh, we were just talking about Jasper's endemic availability in the act of choosing I become myself, you know? Uh, you have to have an ego to lose an ego, you know? You have to, there is something about, I'm not just going to take this drug and see what the drug does. I'm not just going to be passive, you know, that's sort of like lying on the, floor as a steamroller rolls over you, you know? Uh, but I'm going to choose from all I know about these people, this drug, 
the reputation of this research center, uh, the proper dosage and purity, uh, the confidentiality, the aesthetics. In this situation, I choose to dive off the diving board into the water when I don't know the temperature or the depth, you know? So there's an act of intention, of courage, uh, that comes out of this grounded interpersonal relation. I think of it like grounding in the, in the electrical circuit, you know? You are grounded with the therapist. And incidentally, in psychedelic therapy, touching is allowed. We even rehearse it the day before. Not required, but there's something about human touch that allows people to let go much more completely, at least many people. Uh, and it's a sense of grounding of, I'm not alone in the world. Um, Let me look at my cheat sheet here, see if there's a major point I, I want to be sure I don't forget. You know, we have um, hypotheses that we live with as psychedelic therapists uh, that could be wrong, but one of them is this principle that if something emerges in consciousness, the person is ready to deal with it that you don't have to worry about releasing too much too soon. You don't have to worry about re-traumatizing a person if the relationship is established. Uh, and that's held up very well. And my, my own uh, hypothesis really is that if there is something the person is absolutely not ready to deal with, it won't even appear. And if it enters consciousness, it's like the psyche is saying, let's go to work, okay? And you go to work, clearly, by not running away. Anyone ever have a nightmare here? <laughs> you know what happens if you run away from something, right? It gets bigger, you get smaller, you wake up in a cold sweat, and when you go to sleep again, it's still there, you know? Um, so the guideline is we don't run away from anything. No matter how beautiful, no matter how scary, no matter how boring, no matter how exciting. Always in and through, in and through, in and through. Um, Call it intention, call it courage, call it curiosity, call it leap of faith, you know? But it's important that the therapist really believe that, you know? That I'm not going to sit here and say, oh my gosh, is my patient going psychotic? Where are the rescue meds, <laughs> you know? But whatever is happening, we can deal with it, we'll meet it, we'll move through it. <coughs> and invariably, in my experience, which is a few years now, you know, if there's something frightening and you approach it, there's always resolution. 
It really comes to you to teach you something. It's an invitation to spiritual, psychological maturation. And so there's nothing, there really is ultimately nothing to fear. There may be scary moments, but there's nothing to avoid. So the instruction is, you know, in the six hours of the psilocybin experience, you may have all kinds of different experiences, but we'll just take them in the order that they come. And each one, you dive into it, you embrace it, you welcome it, and then that leads to the next one, and the next one. And you collect experiences. Here's another bit of wise counsel to try to teach people. Uh, you don't try to understand it when it's happening. You know, it's, that's our favorite defense mechanism of intellectualization. You know, it got us through graduate school, you know? <laughs> but stop, I gotta label you before I can experience you, you know? No, you just let the intellect go out and play for six hours. You bribe it, telling it, when you come back in, we'll give you new things to think about. And you can take all your knowledge of depth psychology and comparative religions and physics, and you can play with all these new experiences. But while they're happening, intellect, you go out and play. Because you know, it, it is an intuitive experience that's unfolding. And cognition, at least in the moderately high and high dose ranges, really gets in the way. Um, Well, I could talk and talk and talk here, but I think it would be good to move into a, uh, a dialogue mode um, with Michelle and, and uh, Fred. Hey. Thank you. Whatever you like. why uh, it's been so wet um, and uh, yeah, moist in the UK for the last, last, last month or so. Um, of course it makes it ideal for mushroom growing. <laughs> <laughs> it is the season um, for mushrooms and um, we have a particular mushroom here in the Europe, Europe, the Liberty Cap, uh, which is indigenous and happens to contain um, the largest quantity of psilocybin or the mushrooms. So it seems symbolic as um, the nose of our thanks that we present you um, with a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Fred Reinhold and Michelle Baker-Jones up onto the stage. Um, I'll say a few words about them as they come up. Um, Fred, in fact, um, and, and Bill go, go way back. I think this is true, isn't it? Um, and um, Fred used to work with Bill in, in Johns Hopkins. And, uh, as, he, as he said to me once, um, love had its way. And he, he came over to Guernsey um, after working in Johns Hopkins for many years. Um, and it was from there that Compass brought in here. Um, so through Bill's tutelage of Fred, Fred came to tutor me um, mm. and us here. And um, ah, there's so much love for that here. <laughs> there's so much gratitude. And, and, and Michelle, um, who uh, I did sort of the guiding with at Imperial in the pilot trial, and we were feeling our way forward with this research very early days, it felt like to me. Um, we learned from Bill. Um, so 
feels like we're spanning generations um, with, with psychedelic therapy, and, and that, that was that was the idea for this final part of the evening, which is going to be a, um, a panel discussion um, that is um, led by us, but also informed by you. Um, so we will have a couple of people with microphones um, roving about. We're going to be doing that. So, yeah, press the buttons. And I, I, I thought um, I might just allow, uh, if that's okay, Fred and Michelle, a few minutes just to speak about your reflections on how you've come to be here tonight and um, the journey that you've shared with Bill. And, um,
And then unfortunately, uh, as James said, my heart was stolen and I found it on the island of Guernsey and thought that all of this was behind me. It was almost like a dream, as much as I had learned about uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, I was content to think that that was then. <coughs> and then I got a call to see if what Bill had taught me might be transferable to the programs over here in Europe and ostensibly with, or specifically with Compass. Compass asked me if I might be able to help them uh, when they were initially trying to get psilocybin into hospices in Alabama and Utrecht. And then uh, now with the uh, treatment resistant depression study, I'm able to bring what I learned from Bill to Compass and uh, hopefully to the many therapists that have come through King's for training. So imagine I'm just uh, a very lucky person. And some of those therapists are here, um, which is wonderful. Um, I, you know, I, I, I want to stress that we're all still learning. Yeah. Uh, with, you know, I. I one thing I have just learned, you know, I always had this idea, you know, uh, low dose brings up material from the personal unconscious, and a moderate dose will probably get into kind of symbolic archetypal realms. But, you know, if you really want to go for the uh, pure white light of the void, or whatever you want to call it, you, you need a high dose, but not too high, you know? And in, I'm doing a study right now with uh, professional religious leaders from different world religions. Very, very fascinating. Uh, but they get 20 milligrams in the first session, and then the second session we can either hold it at 20 or go up to 30. And I've instructed several who kind of had essentially mystical types of experiences in their first session with 20 milligrams. And when we went up to 30, they got into their uh, interpersonal relationships and their childhood. <laughs> so, you know, more is involved than dosage, you know? And it's just fascinating. It feels like uh, what these drugs really do is simply unlock the door to the unconscious or other states of awareness. And then the individual agenda of the person takes over, you know? And whatever that growing edge is, it unfolds. And if there's several sessions, one often seems to kind of begin where the last one left off, you know? But there's a meaningful process of unfolding, of healing, I think, going on. It's fascinating. I'm just learning that myself. I often think that sort of oscillating between a mystical and biographical is, is really useful. There's something about feeling, you know, that profound connection in the uh, mystical that sometimes enables the biographical to, to be tolerable and to go and work through that, you know, the psychological realms. I think they definitely, you know, complement each other. I agree, and also the the trigger that may open access to the transcendental is often in the very nitty gritty uh, realms of human relationships. Mm -hmm. It's one world. I think um, the word that keeps keeps coming up for me is um, is respect. Um, and um, the, the respect that one needs um, for these drugs and this therapy. And um, I was talking to, 
talking with a statistician, to, one of the statisticians that works on the trials, you know, he's been quite bullish about getting people through the trial, you know, numbers, and I said, I, I, I can't do that. Uh, I can't do that, because it will disrespect um, the process and the drug and what you've spoken about, the, the, the um, almost sanctity of the trust and the, the rapport that needs to be uh, developed for um, you give people um, this drug. And um, that is so much about what good human relationships are about as well. Um, but it's, um, I'm grateful to be able to bring that into the clinical trial environment to a research environment. Um, because my pathway to doing clinical trials with psychedelics was via mainstream psychiatry and via the NHS, where it can sometimes feel like a manufacturing line. Um, and it made me very sad. Um, so I'm grateful to be able to be doing something that respects those core qualities of humility and respect and trust and openness and empathy. Um, it's gratifying to be to have the time and the space to do that, but I'm almost mindful of um, the influences that may um, corrupt that in a sense and the need to retain that. <coughs> but that then speaks to um, that then speaks to some of the difficulties um, in maintaining um, the quality of this process and this therapy. And, and I think I think that's been one of my great anxieties going forward is that we don't we don't repeat what happened before. And I I wonder though, can you can you say a little bit about that? Um, we are in a different position to where we were in the 60s. Yeah. But there are some forms of narrative running through our society that still cause me deep concern. Um, and I'm ultimately asking for you to assuage my anxiety about where we're going. Of course, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where we're going. It's about how we work with the uncertainty. But you know, the 60s, for those of you who were there, were, were pretty crazy, you know, there was so much change going on with the Vietnam War and the women's movement and changing sexual mores and uh, interracial relationships. And, you know, it was a huge uh, period of cultural change. And in many ways, I think LSD became the whipping boy or the, the symbol of all that change. Um, if we could just make LSD go away, we'd all go back to normal. You know? It doesn't work that way. Um, one thing that really strikes me is how differently the press has responded in the last couple decades compared to the 1960s. In the 1960s, there was all the sensationalistic stuff, you know. Psychedelics are going to make deformed babies. They're going to make you jump off skyscrapers. Uh, you know, and there's almost none of that. And uh, the research results are accurately reported um, in uh, in prestigious. Uh, uh, journals and newspapers and magazines. Um, I think another factor is that even those who did not try psilocybin mushrooms in college back in the 1960s generally had friends who did. And they know that most of those friends turned out pretty well. You know? And many of those people whether they use shrooms or not, are now the judges and the lawyers and the FDA officials. <laughs> you know? uh, 
And the, the, the old scare tactics really don't work. And uh, also back in the 60s, I mean, there were literally government pamphlets that had propaganda. It was really inaccurate information being promulgated. You know, it, it was like an old witch hunt or something, you know? And uh, we've survived that era. I think we still need to do the very best research we can. We need to talk very respectfully to the uh, uh, regulatory agencies and speak in a language that they can understand. And uh, my own cause is to, you know, with Compass and USONA and other uh, groups Beckley here, uh, to move towards really uh, coming up with the data that justifies the rescheduling of psilocybin. I think it's smart to just concentrate on psilocybin right now. Let's get one substance legalized, you know, yeah. at least approved for medical use. And that's step one, you know. And uh, so it can really become available in palliative care in the treatment of addictions, in perhaps treatment of depression, um, within just a few a few years. I don't think that's impossible. No. And many of you may contribute to this, you know? Hang in there. Yeah. I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually it sort of underlines a lot of what I what I thought, which was that um, in a funny way, uh, the political reaction, um, political reaction to psychedelics, uh, gave us a regulatory system that allows us now to have conversations with government in a way that they can understand. So there's a paradoxicality there, uh, but also um, a sort of reassurance and a progression um, towards something else. Towards something else. I think um, you know there's a reason why we concentrate on psilocybin, and that's because it doesn't have quite the same stigma um, as LSD. Um, and um, I, uh, developing a political um, a political um, document at the moment for the Adam Smith Institute, and the basic crux of the argument is um, here's some evidence about the medical use of psilocybin. And when have you ever heard of psilocybin killing someone at a festival? Um, and that, um, that brings me um, a little bit to the difference between a scientific argument, a rational argument, and an emotional argument. Um, and of course, I don't know if David Nutt is here, he, I did hear, did hear rumours that he was coming, but I'm not sure he is. Usually I can detect his presence. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I adore David and think he's done the most fantastic work, and yet, one woman and her epileptic child changed the government's mind on cannabis uh, when 30 years of um, research into relative drug harms um, by him didn't. So, uh, there are many narratives at play here and there is the scientific evidence gathering narrative which I can do, uh, but then there is the um, sort of emotional, non-rational element that I think is up to all of us um, to do. Um, but to speak in a speak in a way with people who would be sceptical of what we want to achieve in a way that reflects what we are trying to achieve. And that is these core um, qualities of respect and honesty and openness and um, empathy, um, positive regard. Um, and with that, hopefully we can build something better and challenge the dogma that has defined the last, well, nearly 50 years. So with that little spiel, um, <laughs> I thought perhaps we'd use the remaining time to open um, the floor up to questions. And I see um, the gentleman here. There are roving mics, um, which Catherine and Asta have. If you could um, put up your hands. Um, just to indicate that you want to answer a question and I'll try to come to you in order. Thank you. And could you just say who you are, just so 
Um, my name is John Anderson. Um, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, but um, thanks to my own philosophical experience, I decided to retrain as a person-centered counselor, and so I'm currently a student counselor. I also feel a bit conflicted because I have bipolar, um, and I know that by now it's not recommended as a potential treatment for somebody like me. But I can honestly say that if it hadn't been for my therapy, which I accessed outside of the UK, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be dead, because I couldn't see a point in living anymore. And it wasn't until I had my philosophical experiences that it really turned me around. And the thought that there are people like me who are struggling, and they can't access this, and even if it is legalized in the UK, when would we be able to access this? What does our research even look like? It's not even on the board right now. But what I do know from my own experience is it requires tailored intervention. And maybe it requires understanding of the subtypes of bipolar. Maybe there are some types of bipolar where actually, with the right support, it can work. So when I feel conflicted, I think that if I think from a point of view of a scientist, as somebody who wants to fundamentally do no harm to somebody else, I understand the need to take things slowly. But as somebody who has bipolar and has been at that door, I'm conflicted <laughs> about it. So I guess my question to you, Bill, and I, and I say thank you very much for everything you've said. I mean, I, I've been a long-time fan of, of yours, um, and it's just really great to hear you talk in person. My question to you is, in the future, how do you think somebody like me with bipolar could perhaps be supported by this therapy for that line? Actually, um, Scott Aries in the, the Shepherd Pratt Hospital in Baltimore <coughs> is uh, very interested in working with bipolar disorder and psilocybin in the may well uh, happen. You know, there's a real difference between a research project and clinical treatment. You know, our research projects always want to have a, a, a group of very similar uh, participants. We're limited by budgets. We can maybe give the drug once or twice or three times, and maybe with a control substance. And, you know, that's a research project, you know? And we hope to at least measure some <coughs> incremental improvement. Not necessarily a cure, you know? But something uh, worth, worthwhile, you know? In the past, especially back in the 1960s uh, and 70s, there was this t tendency to say, you know, if one dose of LSD doesn't cure alcohol uh, disorder, then the drug is worthless, you know? But no one would ask, well, what would two or three doses do? Or more hours of preparation, or more hours of integration, or, or maybe another opportunity for a booster dose in six months. But there would be, we would do studies, and there would be the report that always looked promising, but wasn't uh, miraculous. And, but the response of the press would tend to be, if it's not miraculous, it's worthless. And I don't think we're struggling with that now. It's like if we can demonstrate significant movement, progress, then the day will come when a clinician can choose how many sessions, what dose, what dosage, how many hours of preparation, how many hours of integration, you know, what social networks to plug into, etc. That's treatment. But it takes a while to get there. Mm -hmm. And for example, uh, we screen out uh, anyone right now who has a biological uh, relative, first degree relative who's been psychotic. You know? That's not because we know it wouldn't be helpful to that person. 
It's because it's, it's an unknown factor that we don't want to build into a limited research project with limited funding. You know? But maybe someone will do a, another project in the future with a sample like that. You know? Another frontier I always like to uh, emphasize is work with sociopathic personalities, especially young people who are just uh, solidifying their sociopathy. Sir. If my hypothesis would be if you can provide, if you can establish a relationship, facilitate one of these transcendental experiences where there's a sense of belonging, interconnectedness, beauty, value, you perhaps can awaken a, a system of ethics that's innate within us. But yeah, you might have to have an inpatient facility. You might have to also help a person find a job. Uh, it's a major research commitment. But you compare that to locking people up for their whole lives in prisons. And, wow, what a frontier. And there are just countless uh, applications that are waiting to be explored. Yeah, I think that's true. I just, just add, I, I just want to mark your courage in, in saying what you did. Thank, yeah. thank you. Um, thank you, Joe. Yeah. Um, it's a process of getting a foot in the door um, because we're working against years of, of stigma and um, various other forms of opprobrium and it's it's great that we can do the research now but I, uh, I think we need to be mindful of um, trying to run before we can walk um, and for various reasons um, we're concentrating on depression to start to do. And I think if we can demonstrate a value there, and if we can get a license there, then that whole uh, creative process of clinical treatment opens up because we can start to experiment outside the terms of that license legally. But I hear completely what you're saying. And one of the things that preoccupies me as a psychiatrist is what harms do we cause by trying to avoid harm? Um, and it, I, I think that's partly what, what, what we're talking about. You know, it's, a, it's a different um, <coughs> conversation, but it's, it's on my mind. Um, so let's, um, let's get across the first hurdle first, over the first hurdle first, and, we, and then we start to think about um, other um, areas of treatment. But I hear you, it's in my mind. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to introduce yourself a lot? Please. Uh, hi, I'm Philip Adam. I just finished my master's at infected sorts here in uh, King's College. Um, so right now I'm an employee to try to figure out what to do about it. <laughs> um, actually, I have a whole list of questions, but I'll stick with one, maybe two, if that's possible. Um, but for the first one, I guess it's directed at all of you. Um, in the realm of such novel research with psychedelics, um, I'd like to know your thoughts on other substances, such as uh, MDMA therapy that's being done by MAPS out in uh, California, and particularly why there's a bit of an Atlantic divide where um, there seems to be much more uh, MDMA therapy research being done in America, but not so much here in Europe, and, and for the psilocybin therapy, there seems to be much more here in Europe than there is in America, at least according to my little bit of research. When it comes to MDMA and psilocybin, I think you know we're kind of talking about sapphires and rubies. You know, <laughs> they're, they're both wonderful substances. <laughs> 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 um, uh, MDMA therapy. Uh, yeah, I talked with Rick Dobbin about this. Uh, my impression is that MDMA has a higher probability of kind of opening up. If you want to think in the old chakra system, the heart chakra, the, the realm of the ego of interpersonal relationships, uh, of deep trust, uh, psilocybin 
maybe has a higher probability of opening up the so-called crown chakra, uh, these deep uh, uh, transcendental states of consciousness beyond the everyday self. So, uh, you know, but neither is totally exclusive, you know. Uh, it's been suggested, especially for people with strong uh, needs to control, uh, obsessive compulsive traits who find it very hard to establish a trusting relationship, that perhaps an MDMA session might prepare one for a psilocybin session, deepen the trust in the therapeutic relationship. Uh, who knows? Uh, that's research waiting to be done. Uh, but both uh, substances are, uh, uh, you know, moving ahead uh, on the fast track with the support of the FDA, and uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> We will. Um, is it, does that answer your question? Oh, yes, but I had a second one if that's also. I think if, if it's okay, perhaps um, to give other people a chance. Uh. Hi, Mark. Um, so I'm Chloe. I'm the master's here in the Earth Science and Logistics at the Euro Medicine back in Belfast. Um, but yeah, I just have the question of, and excuse my ignorance if this is like, there's a very obvious answer to this, but um, have there been any studies to use psychedelics in the treatment of body image dysmorphia for the likes of anorexia, nervosa, or um, just various eating disorders? And what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that could be in the realms of possibility? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening for the material, so we're in the process of doing that. It's also going to happen at Hopkins, <coughs> but we're just getting started on that project. Okay. Yeah, so there's a sort of there's a sort of commonality, which is uh, uh, habitual ways of thinking and perceiving and feeling, um, and that can be applied to so many things in life, be it body image or the drug uh, or depressive way of thinking or relating with your body to someone else. There's a fascinating dynamic that's become clear in the, our work with uh, nicotine addiction. Uh, you know, people have tried to stop smoking cigarettes over and over and over and over and fail. And then they have a profound suicidal experience. And typically they say, well, they become, I think, they would say, I've become aware of all these inner resources within me and how miraculous my body is, really. Why would I put a poison into it? And, of course, I've got the resources within to stop, to control my addiction. Mm -hmm. it, it, these profound experiences change how you view yourself how you view other people, how you view the world. So, uh, you wake up to parts of yourself that you didn't know were there. And they stay awake if you're lucky. So they kind of foster psychological flexibility in a lot of pathologies are really legitimately fixation to that flexibility, how you position yourself towards your issues. Really makes a huge difference. And fostering that can really be a big game changer. Um, Chat in the blue, Will. Experience they go through. 
So if you have thoughts as to how, you know, in a regulatory sense, you can make sure that once it is licensed, that people get that full experience, that it's not just pushed out as a, as a, as a kind of quick win chemical, but that same quality of care in both the preparation and the reintegration, make sure that people get that full experience once it gets outside of the, um, the trust and the passion that the, these, you guys as the kind of leaders of this uh, want to make sure it's pure too. Um, I think you'll have to be part of the license. Uh, so there will need to be a legal and regu regulatory uh, mandate for um, a certain quality standard. And it will need to be delivered in specialist centres that are dedicated to that. Um, and for that reason, um, it's likely to be quite expensive. Um, but we need to do that, otherwise it will fail. Um, and so that is very much on my mind, and I know it's on um, the mind of the Compass and um, other people who are, who are developing uh, this treatment. There are ways and means of doing that in healthcare. Uh, they essentially revolve around a complex, <coughs> complex um, system of, of regulatory oversight and independent um, oversight of, of systems. Um, I draw on the example of, of ECT, if it wasn't um, slightly macabre. But there are, um, there are standards defined for ECT clinics, for example, that um, we have to, um, we have to, uh, we have to obey, and we have to undertake in order to provide the right context for ECT, if there is one. Um, and I see the same sort of regulatory fra framework being in place for the delivery of drug catalyzed psychotherapy. Um, and it will mandate uh, the uh, delivery of a package of psychological support and um, a certain setting. Um, and as part of that package, um, will involve uh, a therapist <coughs> training program to make sure that, that people are um, doing what they're meant to when it comes to this um, therapy and providing them with providing the therapists themselves with the set and setting that allows them um, to um, embody those sort of core qualities that, that come up again and again and again. So, um, it's like a complex answer, um, but it's, it, it will be um, a complex process of regulation, but the first thing we need to do is get the licence and um, define the terms of that licence. That will guide us. I think I think uh, James is talking about a package that would have um, uh, enough preparation and integration incorporated into it. If the package is too light in preparation and integration, too much into just applying the medication, the medication won't be effective if it isn't treated with respect. Yeah, along with that are these very practical considerations of if we want this to be accessible, affordable, we want insurance companies to cover this. Uh, it can't be psychoanalysis for 10 years, you know? <laughs> you know, and so it's like how, how do we define uh, kind of the minimal unit of preparation drug session and integration that will work for most people. And some people may need to tack on to that a few extra hours, you know? But, but I think uh, just as in, there's many things in surgery you don't just, you get pre prepared for the surgery, you get the surgery, you get the aftercare. And it's a similar pattern, I think, uh, with psychedelic therapy. Um, yeah. I, I think a key, a key concept will be flexibility of approach as well. You know, so some people need more, some people need less. So that will be built into it, and, and to an extent is built into the trials that we do, although we are um, sort of constricted uh, by trial regulations um, at the moment. So, so that's the way we're thinking about it. Um, Grey, grey t-shirt. Thank <laughs> you.
I'm Bernard Anders, a guest at uh, the Azure uh, Bank for, for quite a number of months uh, with Cobalt Post Bank Express. Uh, not just due to Cobalt, but due to travel and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, um, and, and where I think we may find a problem, what I find the problem is, is like that whole cake when you might as well is done um, at Maudsley, um, but it's, it's on release, we get released back into. Say, I wouldn't say the wireless, but back into, into everyday life. And, and then foundations of, of, of my slopes aren't there. And I, I, I just I worry because I, I get one one hour session a week at Tills at St Pancras. And sometimes I have to deal with then a whole week of absolutely horrific, horrendous kind of personal thoughts about uh, myself and not being, being good. But I know I did the right thing at the time. Um, but it, it's that whole discharge then if you've had this psychedelic like, uh, medication and you, you've had the build up to it, you've had the, the whole kind of talking, the, the guided um, therapy, what happens then for that person to get reintegrated back into everyday life and find a job, find self belief, self worth, and things like that? Um, yes, for me, is the work undergoing now to. Um, to get places like the Anxiety Disorders Unit ready for um, for these drugs, which will come in eventually. We, we, we know they will, it may take some time, but that aftercare and uh, primary and secondary care, <coughs> and the tertiary care is there, or going to be there, it, it is, is, is a process in order now to get it at the grassroots of understanding uh, at a primary care level. Pilot trial at Imperial, we were aware that yes, having the doses of psilocybin and then going back to a life which hasn't changed was really problematic. So, even though things were great for a while, so Loss and myself developed an integration group um, which people can come to monthly. So, that's something you know, something that can help you with that integration of the experience. But yeah, the whole culture will need to kind of make space to. to, to enable that container so the culture still needs to adjust, we need to be able to integrate into the culture. And at the moment it's same steps but there will need to be these kind of integration groups or other ways of helping people because it is incredibly difficult once you've had this kind of experience and then you kind of you feel a bit left time dry and there's no way to kind of so all all of I think all that has to develop too alongside this treatment to make it, you know, to make the society hold it to be open to, to people's experience. So you don't feel we had someone in our group who travelled all the way from Yorkshire because they couldn't they went to a therapist in Yorkshire who wasn't very psychedelic friendly, but came, coming to our group made a huge difference. They felt heard and they felt, you know, that they weren't alone with that experience. So there definitely needs to be more in the culture and more in the container developed. I like to use the word initial integration. You know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, we can only offer so much in the context of a research study. Um, but just to really get the idea that continuing integration, especially with some of these profound experiences, probably going to go on the rest of your life. You know, and uh, what works for you? You know, what group support? What individual support? What? Uh, uh, communion with nature, what producing art, what writing, uh, you know, whatever your thing is, uh, cooking, go for it, you know. Um, and we had one volunteer who uh, uh, went and uh, hiked the Camino in uh, um, Spain uh, to integrate. And he came back to the United States for one week and then he went back and hiked the trail a second time. <laughs> but for him, that provided yeah. what he needed to uh, mm -hmm. digest all that had happened in, in uh, his psychedelic sessions. I just want to come up with that. Um, as a kind of caveat to saying that it's not like Brenda's all the time. Uh, I really trained as a paramedic and now I'm a chef in London. <laughs> so you can do
Uh, on exam day, I'm training for psychotherapy, so I was interested in your comments, Bill, about um, he said something along the lines of spiritual insights coming more from psychiatry, psychology departments than divinity faculties or something. Um, and you, you said something about you're doing a trial at the moment with uh, spiritual leaders of, of um, different religions, and I was wondering whether you had anyone from the Native American church involved in that, in their relationship with priority, and that it's almost treated as a sacrament there, because it, it seems there'd be a lot to learn from them. You know, I didn't hear everything you said, but uh, you know, yeah. people sometimes do refer to psilocybin as the sacrament that works. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, it does uh, facilitate incredibly meaningful states uh, for some people. And, uh, you know, it's theorized that these states of consciousness may really lie at the origin of most, if not all, of the world religions. Uh, and uh, I think it's an inc incredible frontier in religious studies, if you will, uh, as well as in medicine. I think one of the things he asked Bill was, um, was whether you had any members of the Native American church um, in the trial of the <coughs> um, undertaking at the moment. No, no members of. Well, actually, to qualify for, for this study, you have to have no prior psychedelic experience. <laughs> so, the <laughs> Native American, the only ones who we could not qualify. <laughs> But no, uh, it's, uh, we won't be publishing that study for a couple of years yet, actually, because of the follow-up. I'm uh, just starting the last volunteer, uh, actually later this week. Um, but uh, there are representatives of uh, most of the major uh, world religions. And uh, in founders, uh, I can say, very valuable. And, and of course, religious professionals are human like the rest of us. You know, they have their interpersonal issues to sort out, and there are marriages that are troubled, and they're uh, working on the level of the personal unconscious. But then there's also these very uh, beautiful, visionary, and transcendental states that uh, can give a new confidence to their uh, profession, really. And then, my gosh, when they get up in the book, they really believe what they're saying. <laughs> and that it really makes sense. So the dead dog starts to come alive. You sense what the symbolic language is really trying to communicate. And uh, so it's fascinating. My crazy fantasy is that seminaries will someday offer uh, uh, workshops with some side on weekends for academic credit as <laughs> <laughs> part of a uh, seminar and religious experience. Why not? It's a, it's a non-addictive substance uh, that can engender some very meaningful insights and relationships. Why should that be part of education? I think psychiatrists used to be encouraged to take LSD uh, prior to prohibition so that they could understand um, or better appreciate the mental states of, of some of their patients and um, their ultimately altered states of consciousness. It feels to me that that might be a good point to draw things to a close. And I'm only saying that because we're running over time and I know that there is a drinks reception outside where we will all be at. So you can ask us your questions then, if that is okay. Um, I want to thank from the bottom of my heart, Bill, for everything that you've done um, and for this evening. It's been an honour and a pleasure. And to Michelle, I pray that you can join me in thanking them and giving them a